Welcome to another in a series of lessons on HVAC and controls. We have titled this series HVAC Quick Info Series, as we will be providing this information in fast-moving, short, easy-to-access videos. I'm Norm Christofferson, your host for the series. The topic for this uh, video is Part 1 on HVAC System Types and Their Classifications. We will be providing the big picture view of the major HVAC system types, their major parts, location with respect to the entire system, and their overall function. Other video lessons in this series will cover each type singly in a little more detail. For now, let's get acquainted with them. We will cover the four common types on our list here, and in part two of this series, we'll discuss several additional types. The first system we'll take a look at is a 100% outdoor air system. Now we use a lot of three-letter acronyms as well as two-letter acronyms as shortcuts for longer names. And so we're going to be seeing several here. Outdoor air is OA, EA for exhaust air, RA for return air, and there are others that we will run into as we look at a variety of uh, sketches and diagrams. Our 100% outdoor air system brings all of its air from the outside of the building through the outdoor air damper. And then we see it's taking that air and filtering it, running it through what is called a preheat coil. It's a heating coil, followed by a cooling coil. Those coils are fed with either chilled water from a chiller or hot water from a boiler. And then the air is pulled by a fan and it is moved down the main duct and then it goes off into what we call zones, and these are just another name for rooms. And so we have zones or rooms one, two, and three. Just before the air enters the uh, zone or the room, there's another heating coil that we could use here as well. This is a, an auxiliary kind of a heating system near the room up in the ceiling. We'll talk about this stuff in more detail later. I want you to notice that any air that is conditioned, sent to the room, either as heated or cooled or some combination of the two, uh, enters the room and then it uh, is pulled out of the room and there's a return fan. And then we're discharging all of that air outside the building to the exhaust side. So that's why we call this a 100% outdoor air system. This is not an efficient system. Obviously, we're going to pay to heat or cool all of our air and then turn right around and discharge it out of the building. We will not be recirculating any of that air, so we're not going to be able to uh, bring any preconditioned or conditioned air back and recirculate it. We're going to have to pay to bring all our outdoor air in and condition it and pay for that. There are places where this is a very, very important system to have. For example, Let's say it's a hospital and these are surgical rooms or uh, places where we are have uh, patients who have a disease. We want to have lots of outdoor air ventilating that room. There are other places where we would use 100% outdoor air. Let's say it's some kind of a battery factory. So what's in the production areas in those zones would be uh, maybe lead and acid in the, in the air, things like that. So uh, we're going to have some places where it's really essential to use a 100% outdoor air system. For, for health purposes. Uh, however, most places are not going to do this. We probably want to recirculate most, most of our air or a good proportion of it. And we'll see that in some of our other examples. Anyway, this is the 100% uh, outdoor air system. I will point out that not all systems have both a supply fan and a return fan. We obviously need a supply fan, the one that's right after the coils, but we have a return fan here as well. Uh, sometimes we need a return fan in order to help induce getting that air out of the building and sending it outside. That's uh, not a, a component we always have, but uh, many systems do have a return fan. We might have to have that return fan just to overcome the resistance of that ductwork uh, that we need to uh, pull that air through. This mixed air single path system is uh, far more common. In the 100% outdoor air unit, we were bringing all of our air in from the outside, treating it, and then basically throwing it away out the exhaust air side. And here we are going to bring maybe 10 or 15% of our air in from the outdoor air side, but we are going to be taking most of our air back in from the return air side and mixing it with that outdoor air, and then we'll call that mixed air. Then we'll run it through the filter, through the cooling coil, heating coil, as may be necessary, and then the fan will move it on down the duct and into the into the zone. 
Now, when you open up your outdoor ear damper, even 10 or 15 percent, you are going to be pressurizing the building. Therefore, we're going to uh, need to exhaust some air just to control the pressure in the building. It is entirely possible to bring in so much outdoor air that we would overpressurize the building and actually blow the doors open on their hinges. In fact, if you were to bring in way too much outdoor air and you didn't have any exhaust air, so you didn't uh, relieve some of the building pressure, you can actually blow a window right out of a building and those kinds of things do happen. So beginning on the outdoor air intake, maybe 10 or 15 percent of our air comes in from the outdoor air. We filter it, we cool it, we heat it if it's necessary. The supply fan moves it down the supply duct. And I want to stop right there because we call this a single path system. We call it mixed air because we're mixing return air with outdoor air. But the single path terminology has to do with the supply side of the fan. When we come off the fan, there's one supply duct, so we call that a single path. We will see in another lesson later that sometimes we come off the fan and we split and have two discharge ducts coming off of the supply side of the fan, so we wouldn't have a, a single path anymore. There'd be more than one supply path. So we go down off the supply side of the fan. We're going through a humidifier in this case. It's an additional auxiliary device discharge our air out into the building, into the zone or zones, and then again we have a return fan to help induce that fan back, uh, fan that air back, and bring it back uh, to the uh, exhaust air side or to the return side where it would mix with some outdoor air again. So there you go, a real common mixed air single path system. We'll call it MASP uh, for short. That's a very common industry term. Well, this is another sketch of a mixed air single path. This time we have the rooms or zones in the picture. What's different about this one is we have what we call a terminal reheat. At the termination of the end of the run, that is right at the area where we're going to be discharging air into the rooms, we have up in the ceilings a hot water coil with a valve on it. And then right in the room, we have a temperature sensor on the wall somewhere so that if uh, any of the three rooms begins to get a little chilly, the thermostat can uh, send a signal up to the valve just above the ceiling and open up a hot water valve and uh, warm the uh, air up a little bit for that particular zone or for that particular room. So this gives each of the rooms its own control to a greater degree than what we had before. In the uh, prior systems without the zone reheat, Whatever the temperature was coming down the main duct, that uh, the air temperature is fed equally to all the rooms, all the spaces, and they did not have any individual temperature control. So we call this mixed air single path with terminal reheat. It's another pretty common way to do things. Well, here's another mixed air single path system, but this is mixed air single path variable air volume. It is very much like those mixed air single path systems that we've been looking at, except we look over at the different rooms, the zones, you'll notice up in the ceiling it says a volume damper. That's a variable air volume box. Uh, that's the uh, box that has a damper in it, and it can vary the amount of cool air that we allow to enter that room or that zone. It's controlled by a temperature sensor on the wall. So if the particular room that the thermostat's in begins to get a little too warm, it sends a signal up into the ceiling where it starts to open a damper up and allow a little bit more cool air to come in the room. And if the room cools down, the thermostat notices that, and then it sends a signal back up to that damper and begins to throttle it back and put less cool air into the room. We'll never have that volume damper or that VAV box damper completely close. Even when it's satisfied with the temperature in the room, that room deserves its percentage of the outdoor air, the fresh air that we're bringing in uh, into the uh, system back at the, uh, at the outdoor air damper intake. So as different rooms change their temperature, their individual VAV box dampers will readjust to try to maintain the proper temperature. Very good temperature control and as we're going to see later when we look at this system in detail, this is one of the most efficient systems that we have when it comes to commercial air conditioning. I want you to notice also there's a cooling coil in this uh, system and there's no heating coil. 
Sometimes there are heating coils, but usually this kind of a variable air volume system serves the core, the center of a building, and we have a different system for the perimeter of the building. So uh, the core of the building usually needs cooling and not heating because the core is kind of self-heating. All of the lights and the people and the computers and the equipment that's inside of that uh, core of the building, the center of the building, is not near an outside wall. So the heat in the center of the building and the core of the building kind of builds up in there, and we're going to need cooling because we don't need to heat it. It's self-heating. So that's pretty much the variable air volume system in a, in a nutshell. Well, there you go. That concludes part one. In part two, we're going to cover four more classifications of HVA system types. Thanks for tuning in. This is Norm Christofferson, and I will see you again next time.